Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Reiling, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of two public sessions taking place here in the Greenwald Pavilion as part of the second annual Aspen Action Forum. This forum taking place uh, with many, many thanks to Lyndon Stort Resnick right here in the front row. Lyndon Stort, thank you so much for your generosity. For the past uh, 14 years, the Aspen Institute has been quietly building out something we call the Aspen Global Leadership Network. It's made up now of 2,000 incredible entrepreneurs from 49 countries around the globe. For the last 36 hours and for the next 36 hours, the Aspen Meadows has been full with about 300 of these great entrepreneurs from 31 countries. All of them share a few common traits. They're creative, they are committed, and they are, um, they are courageous. Uh, their courage has come out in the sorts of things they have committed themselves to do in their communities, their countries, their regions in the world. This event is about action and we've asked each of them, as they attend, to come out and make an action commitment. What is it that they're gonna commit to do in the world that will have an impact, a positive impact. So we want to start this afternoon by hearing just a few of these commitments. My name is Katie Albright, and I'm a fellow with Aspen's Ascend program, a two-generation approach to ending poverty. I'm also the executive director of the San Francisco Child Abuse Prevention Center and my action pledge is to create a community in San Francisco where 100% of our children can grow up free from violence and free from fear. Child abuse is the root cause of so many problems that we as a country are trying to fix, from education to the economy, from our healthcare system to our juvenile justice system. Victims of child abuse are more likely to struggle in school, grow up as teen parents, be thrown in jail, end up ha suffering from chronic unemployment and also serious long-term physical and mental health issues. That's why I pledge to take action and I'm doing it in my own backyard in San Francisco. Over the past 12 months, my colleagues and I at the Child Abuse Prevention Center have helped more than 14,000 children, parents, and community members to prevent abuse. We've led a public-private partnership in San Francisco to open up just a few months ago the city's first child advocacy center. It's a place where we provide innovation and coordination to child victims of sex trafficking, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. We've also launched new innovative programs where we can really show that families in our most vulnerable situations are improving their children's outcomes to pr protect them to create a safe space. While we've done a lot in the last 12 months, I'm frankly inspired to be in Aspen, to be with all of you, so that we can further disrupt generational cycles of violence. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Robertson. I'm from the inaugural class, class of the Africa Leadership Initiative. My action pledge last year was to provide uh, 15,000 uh, farmers in northern Uganda with, uh, to register them and to get them involved in organic agriculture. Uh, through my organization, the Gulu Agricultural Development Company, we um, registered 29,400 farmers and we gave them one training session on, on basic agronomy, which enabled them to produce their sesame and cotton and bird's eye chilies more productively. It basically doubled the amount that we bought that year and we sold that, uh, th that crop for them for, for premium prices into Europe. So my action pledge this year is to increase from the 29,400 to 45,000 farmers and to increase the training from one training to nine training modules, which include uh, all the sort of basic um, agricultural processes plus uh, financial services, basic budgeting, and organizational skills. Um, if my competitors 
uh, also operate in this space, but um, my involvement with the Africa, Africa Leadership uh, Initiative uh, really sort of pushed me to, to go that extra mile and provide um, a development services through donor funding rather than just the sort of buy and sell model. Thank you very much. Mm. My name is Mukti Datta and I'm from the India Leadership Initiative inaugural class. I founded, ran and now mentor an organization, a cooperative of women weavers in the Himalayas and North India in which hundreds of women have found economic and social empowerment through weaving beautiful cashmere shawls which are sold locally and also exported. Last year in June there was a horrific cloudburst and um, a glacial lake at a 14,000 foot high temple town of Kedarnath, burst its banks after 72 hours of rain. And the flood which followed this killed 30,000 people, locals and pilgrims. So my pledge was to help the survivors of this horrific flood to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives and to find alternative livelihoods. And along with my team of master weavers from my cooperative, I spent the better part of the whole year in the Kedarnath Valley um, helping out these women. So we formed a new cooperative there with 300 widows who have currently learned how to weave and are weaving their first collection of uh, designer shawls and stoles, which have been designed by one of the top uh, designers in India, Abraham and Thakur. Amit Bhatia was also a classmate of mine who came up to Kedarnath and started a computer center for the children there, which is uh, now being run by one of the young widows, Kiran, who lost her husband and five members of her family in the floods. Um, Nidhi Mani Tripathi of ILI2, who was a government servant, helped in raising funds from government to um, support this program. And three years ago, the McNulty Foundation gave us a grant to train some women in our part of the world as weavers. And I'm very happy to say that the master weavers from this training program are the ladies who came to Kedarnath to teach the widows how to weave. So thank you all, and a special thanks to Peter, who always encourage me, encourages me to stretch myself. Thank you so much. I'm Walter Isaacson. And inspired by all of you all last year, while, while I watched people do their action pledges, I went up to the wall and wrote an action pledge of my own, which is to follow through on an idea that General Stan McChrystal had when he came to the Ideas Festival right before you came, which is to create the opportunity and the expectation that every person in America, every kid in America, would have the opportunity to be part of a service year. I've been involved, thank you. <laughs> I've been involved with Teach for America, and I saw how that transformed that field. We figured out if we could do service years and everything, from law to finance to the environment and energy, and allow people to spend one year of service after they graduate from college or high school career ready, that would be a useful project. I'm proud to say that at the Aspen Institute now, we have something called the Franklin Project. We've just raised, after a big summit at Gettysburg with Stan McChrystal and others, $40 million in order to start service year programs around America. <laughs> Jay Mangone, who served under General McChrystal in Afghanistan, is now at the Aspen Institute helping coordinate this program. We've already created new slots uh, new service corps are up and running in uh, Baltimore, outdoor service cars, and many others. So we hope that we can try to transform, with your help, the idea of making sure that every kid can serve America. Thank you all very much. And now I'd like to bring up a person who has helped us uh, create this, Stuart Resnick. Stuart is somebody who truly knows how to turn thought into action. In fact, he's pushed us into action and pushed us into this action forum, for which thanks. But he and Linda Resnick have not only done the things you know about in Aspen, but in the Central Valley of California, Stuart Resnick and Linda Resnick have created, where they have their agricultural interests, 
a whole new project of uh, both helping kids all the way through and now a new tech academy, a new tech college there in a way so that people can bring skills to the workforce. It's that ability to turn thought into action that is the theme of this uh, festival, but it's also the theme of Stuart's life. So thank you, Stuart, for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs> nice water. Thanks for I'll having me. Yeah. Yeah, right. okay. um, you talk, you've been a disruptor in many ways. Talk about how you disrupt in the agricultural industry where you start. Well, I'm not sure, sure it's a, I guess a disruption is hard to, to find, but when I got into the agricultural business, um, I, I looked at it and I figured out the, the, the whole value chain. And generally what happened is farmers are very focused on production and they understand how to produce the product. But in the end, how you make the most money is selling the product. Mm -hmm. So what we saw the opportunity early on, uh, particularly in the pistachio business, to be a leader because th generally these crops are extremely fragmented so there's no leader to, to promote or to market the product and create demand. So we were able to see that opportunity because when, we, when I got into the pistachio business early on, uh, it was a very new industry in California. If you're in the agricultural business, if it's been around for 20 years, it's still a new industry. But in some ways, your disruption has been by using agriculture to transform communities. Tell me about that. It's what you've done in the Central Valley and other places. Well, our opportunity in the Central Valley, we believe that by doing good, you can do well. And my view is that um, our workforce is a very hardworking, family-oriented group of people. And they're generally taken advantage of. Uh, I mean, it's just the nature. Farming is difficult, and so the farmers oftentimes don't have a lot of sympathy for their workers, to be quite candid with you. We saw the opportunity to really try to respect those people, create a better environment for them, to create a better environment for their children, and we believe that we get a benefit from that. So we've seen the opportunity to give free health care to all our um, employees and their families. Now that again is somewhat self-centered because we believe that we're self-insured or so our, hopefully our insurance rates will go down and we've seen a little bit of that. We were a big employer, um, this town that you talk about called Lost Hills, which we have really rebuilt. Probably 40 or 50 percent of the people in that town have some either work for us or someone in their family works for us. And there we built a park and a recreation building, and it's, it's always hard. I have to give David Rubenstein some, some credit here because he said, you know, when you give charity, you never know, you can't measure your results the same way. So if it makes you feel good, then you're doing the right thing. And here, we were able to at least measure a bit of our success because we, uh, I guess after about three years, we went up to, a, we had a, uh, a health fair in this little town, and Linda and I went up there, and we happened to talk to the uh, sheriff's department. And they said to us, do you know that the, that the crime in this town has been reduced by 80% since you built this park? And so we really feel there that we really have made a, made a big improvement in that, in that town. You've also been at the forefront of nutrition studies and nutrition labeling. Let's first talk about the labeling issue because I think you took it to the Supreme Court recently and won. Yes. Um, it's not over yet, unfortunately. But at least the Supreme Court found us correct, so there's no appeal from that. Basically, what we found, we, I'm new to this packaged goods industry, and hopefully maybe some of you people work for packaged goods companies. I can't help that. But um, I found it to be a terribly dishonest business. And we originally got into the pomegranate juice business because of all the health. We did start doing some research and we found that it was extremely healthy. And it had, and one of the reasons that we thought that we did the research was because the mythology about pomegranates go back in, in every culture goes back for thousands of years, always being a very, very healthy product. So we thought that we would, add, so we planted enough pomegranates when we got into it 10 years ago, the pomegranate, there was maybe 
oh, uh, 800 acres of pomegranates, of which we owned about 200. We then planted uh, 15,000, so we dominated that business. So we had the motivation to do the research. And we found that it was extremely healthy. We sort of got that message out, and we started selling the juice, and we were extremely successful. Then all of a sudden, we saw a lot of copies, and we couldn't understand how they were calling it pomegranate juice because I didn't know where they were getting the pomegranate juice since we had about 80% of it in the whole country. So we then started looking into it and uh, discovered that the, the main um, problem was with a comp uh, Tropicana, which is owned by Coca-Cola. They had a product that they called pomegranate blueberry juice, 100% juice, big picture of a pomegranate, big picture of a blueberry. And we did some tests. We just didn't think it had that much pomegranate juice in it. So we finally sued them for mislabeling. And uh, we discovered that they had three-tenths of 1% pomegranate juice, <laughs> two-tenths of 1% blueberry, one-tenth of 1% raspberry. And the reason they had the one-tenth of 1% raspberry is so they could have five flavors. 99.5% apple and pear juice. Which is just sugar water. Yeah, it's just, it's basically it's strip juice, it's sugar water. Um, they had a defense which said that they met the requirements of the FDA labeling. The judge found that that was a defense. We didn't believe it was a defense. We then took it to the appeals court. The appeals court found, again, for them. We then took it to the Supreme Court. <laughs> okay. And I found this very interesting to me, because I'd never had this experience before, that um, the Solicitor General writes an opinion for the, for the Supreme Court. The Supreme, Supreme Court takes, from what I understand, about one in 500 cases that are brought to them. So we didn't think we had much of a chance. And what he said was that the appeals court found incorrectly for the defense, but it wasn't important enough for the Supreme Court to take up, so just let it be there. So it seemed to me here we were right, but we were going to be screwed. So I just figured, well, that's the way it is, and be done with it. But then the Supreme Court did take it, and they found 100% uh, uh, in our favor that, in fact, it was not that the meeting the label requirement was a minimum, and you couldn't def essentially defraud the consumer. Yeah, but you've been sort of on both sides of the issue of government regulations, government things. How do you sort that out? I mean, how do, what's your own feeling about what the government should be doing in this area? I am not a big believer in government regulations. However, there are, there are some issues where I believe they need to step in. And when we went to the FDA, and it, we even went first to the FDA because people were selling pomegranate juice that wasn't pomegranate juice. And they said, look, we have a lot of sympathy for you, but we don't have, we're worried about people dying. And we can't, we don't have the time to, to uh, work, you know, worry about fraud. Um, the problem is, is that it's a slippery slope. And if you don't have regulation, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're eating. Because, again, I, I'm sympathetic towards the packaged goods industry in a certain sense. Because one, I mean, pomegranate juice is, you know, four or five times as expensive as pear juice, let's say. So the customer, our customer comes and says, well, fine, you're charging me $4 for this. Somebody else is charging me three fifty. Well, the reason they're charging three fifty is they put in less pomegranate juice. And pretty soon, you go from 20% to 10% to three-tenths of 1%. <laughs> and so I think the government, particularly with labeling and nutrition, because I think this is a big, this is one of the issues that, um, Linda and I are very interested in that we think, you know, that there's a big problem with obesity and health. And the two simplest, you know, the, the two least expensive ways to minimize the health problem in America is exercise and diet. But if you don't know what you're, it's hard enough to diet correctly, at least I find that. But if you don't know what you're eating, it even makes it that much harder. So we're big advocates of trying to get um, labeling uh, accurate. Now, this decision will allow the co uh, competitors mm -hmm. to bring lawsuits for unfair competition. So I think, in, in, in essence, the su Supreme Court, when the defense said, look, the government has stepped in here and they, they can oversee this, the Supreme Court essentially said, look, they don't have time to do it. It's not going to happen. And so 
this is a way that we believe that the industry can be policed properly. You're also disrupting the wine industry now, which is good for those of us who uh, <laughs> have trouble saying, okay, this is just going to be, uh, you know, I can count on this wine. Why, why did you go into that industry? Now, I don't think that we're disrupting the wine industry. We're trying to just, uh, no. I went into the wine industry. Why did I go into the wine industry? No. <laughs> I like to drink wine. And I'll tell you, it's really a great excuse. If you're in the wine industry, whenever you go up with another person in the industry, you always drink a lot of wine, and it's very acceptable. Okay, no. <laughs> now, quite honestly, again, it was somewhat the same thing as we saw in the agricultural business. We saw an opportunity that there's a lot of very, very fine winemakers. Mm -hmm. And again, they're farmers, and they're winemakers. And so, but they don't get their brand out. We had Fiji water, and with Fiji water, we had uh, 200 salespeople. And as we got very good uh, distribution, the salespeople really, it, it takes a lot of time to get the distribution. Once you have it, you don't need to call on that customer quite as often. So we thought, what else could we put with our, with our Fiji water? And we thought that wine fits our profile. And so our idea was if we could then go out and this was a good product, but we could introduce it to a number of people on premise, et cetera, it would work. And it's one of the few things that I've ever done that my plans worked as, as I had anticipated. Wow. So that's, that's about, I think it's the only time it's ever worked that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, we still don't make any money because you can't make any money in the wine business because you have a good time. But you're gonna have fun. Yeah, have fun. that's right. it, right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, you've also been very involved as, as Linda in education, education reform. You have John DC. we were just, talking about it last night at dinner with you. Uh, what about skills to the workplace, how we can train people for the workplace needs we have now and the technical college that you've been working on? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, look, people, the agricultural business is a very basic industry and people think of it as uh, not terribly sophisticated. But what we've seen in both our processing and farming now is that as these industries have become more automated because they were very labor intensive for a while. The labor force has changed. Now you need technicians and maintenance people to fix the machinery that you have. And even though there's a quite high unemployment rate in the Central Valley, we've had, we're, we're always, as we've grown, we've hired new employees and it's been a lot, a lot of work to hire these employees to find them. So actually I have to give credit for Linda. Linda's idea was let's do this academy, a, tech, a technical academy where in the four years of high school, they will get a AA degree at the same time and learn a trade and they can go out into the workforce, in the agricultural workforce alone and pretty much start at at least $40,000 a year for an entry level job. This is a very big opportunity in the Central Valley. So we wanted to give the opportunity to those to these um, local people as opposed to bringing people in with the skills. Tell me your views on education in general, where we're heading in terms of education reform, the way colleges operate. Is there gonna be a disruption there? You know, I, uh, I, I think there's a real issue. I mean, and I think it's not the issue of, edu well, education is part of it is this uh, they're sort of the elite and the not elite. And I don't see how a, a, a young person today, unless they have a college education, has much of a chance. As far as, I'm on a board of Bard College and uh, Caltech, Caltech yeah. and they're quite different. And they're struggling, and they, they, no one has the solution yet. Um, but my guess is there will have to be. But I think there's enough energy and focus on it today that we will have to have a different approach just to be, and I think part of that is just to be competitive in the world. Mm -hmm. And train people more directly for jobs. Yeah, I think, look, what we're copying, it's not unique. We're looking at the, the German mm -hmm. concept. In Germany, where a lot of people train for technical jobs and do very well, and they really do a very solid middle class. So we sort of adapted that in terms of the, in the Central Valley to have that same opportunity. For those people who don't have an interest in going on 
to a four-year college and uh, but want to do something you know more uh, blue collar there's a lot of opportunity in those areas and how do you see the American economy going now do you feel it's strengthening <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that? I, well, I, I think we have a, again, I, I don't worry too much about the economy because um, I figure people are always going to eat, so we'll be fine. But mm. when I think about the economy, I think that we had some very early experience in China. <clears throat> we had another business, and we, uh, we were one of the first people that went into China to manufacture some products there because mm. it was handmade products. And this was back in 1985 or 1986. And the expectation of the average worker in this skill is so different than what we have in the US mm -hmm. that this, this competition really makes it very difficult for unskilled people in the US to make a living because we are now in this competitive world. We, we compete with it's not that you compete so much with you, somebody in the U.S. You compete with somebody, everybody in the world, and still, um, the Chinese still, you know, there's a, there was a lot of criticism of them. But when we used to go over there in our factories, and we weren't that happy with the um, the way the the living, um, the, yeah, the living conditions and the factory conditions, it was interesting. At that point in time, you contracted with the government, mm. and they brought the employees in, and we couldn't even give bonuses. Mm. But the employees were very happy because where they came from were some of these small farms where they didn't even have toilets. Mm. So to them, this was a step up, and it was interesting that their morale was very good. So we're competing with, with this in the America. I find that, you know, through my my you know, experience with my grandkids is that their expectations, they all want to be something special and work has to be exciting. Mm -hmm. And what I say is they call it fun and then they call it work. Work is work. <laughs> that means it doesn't have to be that much fun, you know. <laughs> all right. They don't like to hear that, though, I'll tell you. Now, the last question I have is the one everybody's been wondering which is, what is it like to be married to Linda Resnick? <laughs> it's a constant adventure. <laughs> no. It's a lot of fun. Linda and I have very different uh, strengths, I think. We have some that are similar. And uh, I think that we continue to get along quite well. And if anybody asks me why we get along quite well, you know, I say what we do is, you know, it's sort of give and give. Hey. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Next up, we have Henry Crown Fellow, Tamsin Smith, who will present us with a wonderful poem. Thank you, Tamsin. Actually, you're going to get three. <laughs> um, most of us have spent the last two days in dialogue around disruption uh, and leadership, and I'm sure we've all been garnering our most rational, passionate arguments. But it's my thought that we have to move ourselves before we can move the world. And so I'm going to take three shots at trying to uh, shift the ground for you and levitate you a little bit. Uh, poems can do many things. They can be a charm, a torch, a talisman, a touchstone, and sometimes they can be a call to arms. That's a disruptive poem. And those ones generally act kind of like a homing device going to our innermost hopes and fears and, uh, and confusion. And sometimes just discovering that somebody else has put into words that secret, maybe forgotten or unstated or even unacknowledged part of us uh, can be incredibly powerful and incredibly disruptive. So my thought is that we need poems like that. We need art as a prod to get us to that space. 
I'm going to start with a bit of a mashup. It's a, it's a sampler of lines that uh, have really struck me over the years from uh, an international group of poets, Antonio Machado, Mary Oliver, Jane Hirschfield, Craig Arnold, Radcliffe Squires, and Ernst Stadler. Maybe one will strike a chord for you. You can feel free to close your eyes if it helps open them. Traveler, there is no road. The road is made by walking. You have only to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves, as this life is not a gate, but the horse plunging through it. The heart loves the sound of its own breaking. All music is a lost self, and the lost self returns to you only when your grief for him makes you kind. Stop being a ghost. In the wonderful poet Rilke's sonnet to the archaic torso of Apollo, he studies this broken fragment of man's uh, reverence for a higher, a higher power. And he, he works to try to put the, beast, the pieces together and ends up with a pretty stunning uh, final line, which uh, shocks, but also compels and almost seems inevitable. So listen for those last lines and listen to them. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, still gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not gleam like a wild beast's fur, would not, from all borders of its being, burst like a star. For here, there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. So the truth lives inside of us. Art pushes it into the light and makes response unavoidable actionable. We, you and I, are always implicated in the presence of great art. With great art, there are no innocent bystanders. Art provides the idea we must provide the response. And if you'd permit me, I'd like to end with one really beautiful poem by Jules Supaville, just translated by Ken Rex Roth, great San Francisco poet. It was written shortly before the poet's death after a long illness, and it is called Homage to Life. It's good to have chosen a living home and housed time in a ceaseless heart, to have seen my hands alight upon the world as a little apple in a garden, to have loved the earth, the moon, and the sun like old friends who have no equals. To have committed the world to memory like a bright horseman to his black steed. To have given a face to these words, woman, children. To have been ashore for the wandering continents and to have come upon the soul with the tiny strokes of oars because it is frightened by a brusque approach. It is beautiful to have known the shade under the leaves and feel age creep across the naked body and to have accompanied pain of black blood in the veins and gilded its silence with the star patience and to have all these words moving around in my head to choose the least beautiful of them and let them have a ball to have felt life hurried and ill-loved and locked it up in this poetry. Bravo. Thank you.
a fourth poem, the introduction, which is my pleasure to introduce, David Rubenstein, who's a sponsor of this amazing gathering and uh, an underwriter of the China program, which is absolutely phenomenal. He's going to talk to us about um, disruptive leadership in history. So please welcome. Everybody hear me? Okay. So let me talk. I'm going to talk about three different subjects. I talk very quickly, so I'm going to get them all in my allotted time. <laughs> First subject is going to be about uh, what disruptive leadership is all about and why people want to be disruptive leaders. Second is a situation that I face today as a person who's done some disrupting is now possibly being disrupted and I'd like to ask your opinions of what I should do. And third, about some disruptive leaders in American history. Before I get into that, though, I would like to talk about a disruptive thing that happened in medicine that some of you may be familiar with, men particularly. Um, I'm on the Johns Hopkins Board of Medicine, and uh, there's a terrific surgeon at Johns Hopkins that many, men, some men may have heard of, may, I doubt if many women have heard of him. His name is Pat Walsh. Anybody ever heard of Pat Walsh? Okay. Um, I have not had the experience of having to deal with him directly, fortunately, yet. Uh, but um, what he did is something that revolutionized prostate surgery, something you didn't think you'd hear about today. He disrupted prostate surgery. Here's what happened. Normally, when you have a prostate cancer, what happens? Well, the gold standard was you have your prostate taken out. And that has some side effects. And let's say one of the side effects was you might not be ready for the Cialis moment when it came along. Um, and there were some men who might say that's not as you know, full of life. So um, through a research, Dr. Walsh came up with the idea that there's a nerve um, in a certain part of the body that he could um, take a prostate out and, and therefore uh, not take out the ability for a man to be potent again or to not be incontinent. So uh, after a prostate is taken out, one could remain uh, romantic if one wanted to be in that sense. And um, that might be appealing to some people. And so um, this is what he did. And it's a revolutionary thing. And for men who have to worry about this someday, um, it was disruptive, an incredibly disruptive thing. Because until that came along, um, a prostate being taken out was largely uh, uh, not going to be a ro romantic uh, afterwards, let's say, very romantic. So recently, somebody from Goldman Sachs, a friend of mine, recommended that I send a letter to the President of the United States uh, recommending uh, this man for a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And um, I, on the Hopkins board, I was asked because I'm on the Hopkins board and, and other reasons, I guess. And so I said, I'd be delighted to do it. Um, so I wrote a letter out and said, here's why this man deserves a Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest thing that our civilian population can get from the President. And um, I wrote it out and I rewrote it. And then my secretary came in to me and said, now let me see if I got this right. Colin Powell won a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Jim Baker won a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Norman Schwarzkopf won a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And you think a man who made it possible for men to have an erection after a prostate surgery deserves a Presidential Medal of Freedom? <laughs> I said, well, uh, to be honest, um, I'm not sure that they're in the same category. I actually think he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. But, <laughs> but that's not available. So let's just give him a Presidential Medal of Freedom. I hope he gets it. OK. so. On um, disruption. Now, for those who haven't been following all the disruption things that have been talked about, and some of you may not have been in all the, uh, the forums and so forth, what is this big thing about disruption? Let me ask for how many people here want to be a disruptor? OK, you want to be a disruptor. OK. Now, if you look up the definition of disruption in the dictionary, it says somebody breaks up things, is a person who causes problems. When you were in school, let's say in kindergarten or, or first or second grade, your teacher might have said to your parents, this person is a disruptor. We don't want this person. Now everybody wants to be a disruptor. And why is that? Why did everybody want to be a disruptor all of a sudden to break up things? Well, the reason, I think, is this. Uh, there's a man named Clay Christensen who is a professor at Harvard Business School. And he came up with a concept that more or less revolutionized the way people think about technology development and the business about 20 years ago. He's been refining it ever since. It's a revolutionary concept. Many people have criticized it. But I think it really has a great deal of merit to it. And obviously, a lot of you who are participating in the forum have heard about it. And the concept basically is 
that when you are at the top of the mountain, let's say General Motors is the top of the mountain, they're producing cars, they're the biggest car manufacturer in the world, their most profitable car manufacturer in the world, let's say in the 1950s, 1960s, Toyota comes along and says, well, we want to make a very, very inexpensive car that really is the, well below anything that General Motors would sell cars for. And the people at General Motors say, well, who, what do we care about Toyota for? That's, in, you can't make any money at that low price car. Let them make those cars. We don't want that. We don't want those customers. We want the high margin, expensive cars. Okay, so Toyota comes along and they build this car and they sell it. And then the Toyota says, well, we can make a little bit more expensive car. General Motors looks at it again and says, these are still not high margin enough for us. We're not interested. And then this goes on and on and on. Eventually, what you find is that Toyota has eaten General Motors lunch. And this is the concept that really has happened throughout business, where not only that there is change occurring, because change is part of business, it's part of life, it's Darwinian. But it's the concept that, that Clay Christian really, Christensen really focused on, is that it's not just the people who are coming up with change, it's the people at the top who ignore it and who basically are afraid of making a change because they're afraid they're going to give up their high margin businesses. So when they're afraid to give up their high margin businesses, what comes along? Somebody disrupts them. So if you're a digital equipment company, you're making mini computers, and personal computers come along, you say, we don't want these personal computers, we do much bigger things or higher margin, and of course the personal computer business comes along and eats the lunch of digital computer. And, and this has happened throughout business, particularly in recent years, when so many companies have come along. Amazon has disrupted bookstores. Uh, obviously, how many people go to bookstores today compared to what they used to do? Well, what is it that enables you to be a disruptor? Many of you raised your hand and said you want to be a disruptor. Well, you want to be a disruptor in the business sense because many of you think, well, you want to be uh, Jeff Bezos, you want to be uh, Steve Jobs, you want to be Bill Gates, people that came along and disrupted the industry and got the financial rewards and other social rewards from it. What does it take to really be a disruptor? Well, obviously in 10 minutes I'm not going to be able to tell you everything you need to know about disruption, but the key things that I think are important in that is this, you need to have a concept or an idea you have to come up with a concept or an idea that, you know, it's probably going to change things, but millions of people come up with ideas and concepts, and sometimes the very good ones don't get anywhere. Sometimes the not so good ones get somewhere because people push them and push them forward. And that's the second part of being a disruptor. You have to have not only a concept or an idea, but you have to do it yourself. You can't say to somebody, I want to disrupt the industry, uh, here's a good idea, you go do it. People who do the disrupting, uh, Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates or or Mark Zuckerberg, or any of these people, they do it themselves. They don't delegate the disruption. And what they also have, the third characteristic, is they're willing to work and be ridiculed. People come up with ideas like selling books over the internet, or uh, selling, doing something like Facebook. Uh, people are, willing to, are gonna ridicule these people, and you have to be willing to be ridiculed. If you come up with an idea, and it's a good idea, and you're willing to work hard and do it yourself, but you're not willing to be ridiculed, you're not likely to disrupt anybody. You also have to have another characteristic. You have to not care about money. The people who build disruptive companies don't really care about money, certainly at the outset. They want to prove their idea is good. Nobody, nobody who's built a great disruptive company said at the beginning, I'm going to become a billionaire. I'm going to become a, uh, uh, somebody worth $100 billion. Nobody thinks that because if they think that at the beginning, they are, their ego is so out of control, they're never going to get anywhere. People who focus on making enormous amounts of so money when they're starting their company to be a billionaire, they're never going to get there. You have to not worry about money. Money will come later if the idea works. You also have to have if you're being a disruptor, you have to have ability to convince other people of your ideas. You have to be so passionate about it that you're willing to do this to the exclusion of everything else. You have to put the time in. You can't do it, you know, nine, nine to five, five days a week. This has to be your passion for between five and 20 years because it takes a long time to disrupt other industries. You also need a competitor who is willing to be disrupted. You can't disrupt somebody if, if, there's, if there's nobody to be disrupted. And so you need a, a competitor who's willing to basically ignore you. And what you have to do is convince the competitor that they're much smarter than they, than they, than, uh, they think they are. <laughs> All right. So when Bill Gates was uh, working on software and, and IBM was the dominant computer company, they licensed the, the software, that they licensed the software for the PCs. They thought that the hardware was the key thing and the software was not that important. And Bill Gates convinced IBM that they should really let him own the software and not just let them, not just, not just Get, produce it for them to sell, but he would, in effect, own the software. 
and he convinced IBM that they were much better in doing that. You have to convince the, the party that's being disrupted that really they have such a good business now that they don't really need to worry about the small guys coming along. And if you can do that and do all the other things, you're likely to be a disruptor. It's not that easy to be a disruptor, and the, most people who start ideas and start companies probably will not disrupt industries. But those who do will change the world. And that's why I think all the people who are in the business world today always think passionately now about being a disruptor, because they have the idea that the great wealth and fortune and, and social um, um, approval will come from people who disrupt. But it's not that easy, and you need a lot of luck and a lot of skills. And those are some of the characteristics that I've seen. Now, in my own case, let me switch to the second subject. I, I'm not a per person who ever thought I was going to disrupt everything. I was probably the person that the kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher told my parents, this person is too disruptive. Um, so I was disruptive in that sense, but nobody thought I was going to be a disruptive business leader, and I certainly didn't either. And when, when I started my company, which is a private equity firm, um, I, dis and, and I didn't really think of I was disrupting the world or disrupting the private equity industry. And most people who start companies and ultimately wind up disrupting other companies don't think they're disruptive. They don't think so because they think their business is going to be relatively small. None of these people think their business is going to be that big in the beginning. In my case, I started a private equity firm in Washington, D.C., a place where there were no private equity firms so nobody paid attention, nobody, everybody laughed. Why would you do this in Washington? It's a government city. And so private equity was a business known as buyouts or venture capital to, to all of you. And that's a business where historically um, you've got very high rates of return and you've got high, comp high compensation for that. The industry started in the 1960s and 1970s with venture capital in the 60s and buyouts in the 70s. And the people that came along, they came along to do this and they said to their investors, well, we're going to do something that's never been done before. We're going to build companies. We're going to change companies dramatically. We're going to sit on the boards of companies. But it's a long-term process and we're going to work really hard. And well, we just don't want to be compensated the way people who are compensated who run mutual funds. So we want to get a big piece of the profits. And it was agreed more or less at the beginning that 20% of the profits would go to these people who are doing the buyouts or venture capital. That was a gigantic change in the way people were compensated who managed money for other people. 20% of the profits and they convinced people to give them the money for 10 years or so. So they were in a long-term relationship and you got paid a fee for managing other people's money, even if you didn't invest it, just for, com for their committing to give you money, you, you were able to charge them a fee on committed capital. You got 20% of the profits, and you held on to money for a long time. Well, that was the basic business. When I came along, I came up with two ideas with my partners that disrupted the private equity world. We didn't change the economic formula that I just mentioned, but historically in private equity, you had a business which did one thing, which, which um, you, you had, you're allowed to have one business at a time. If the partnership agreement said if you have a buyout fund, you, you have to spend 100% of your time on buyouts. If you're a venture fund, you have to spend 100% of your time on venture. So the concept never really took hold that these businesses could be very big. So the leading firms in, in venture capital or buyouts particularly, they, had very, they were very small firms. When KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, they had about seven investment people. And that's because the partnership agreement said if you're managing my money in this way, you can't do anything else. I decided to, with my partners to ignore that. I decided it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, so I, rather than go to my investors and say, I'm going to do something else, I just decided to do it. And sometimes when you're disrupting, you have to do that. So I decided what I would do is do what Fidelity had done or others had done in mutual fund business. I would, dis I would change the business by having multiple funds. Instead of just having a buyout fund, I'd have a venture fund, a growth capital fund, a real estate fund, multiple funds, institutionalizing the business by having such a big presence, and therefore make us institutional and not just a small mom and pop. Now, that doesn't sound revolutionary to you, but it changed the face of private equity because the larger firms basically did the same thing or are now doing the same thing. These large private equity firms have disrupted the smaller firms by being very, very large. And then the second thing we did is we globalized it. Historically, people who invested in buyouts or venture capital did it only, or on, only in their own industry, and they didn't do it around the world, and we globalized it. So now, I, I, having disrupted the industry with others, I now face this dilemma. I'm, I'm, I'm at the top, and I can be disrupted. So here's a, dis a question I'd like to ask you. Right now, I get 20% of the profits, more or less, on other people's money, assume above a certain preferred return and so forth. Now people come along and say, well, geez, you know, we have a lot of money. We're, we have enormous amounts of money. We're a sovereign wealth fund. We have so much money, but we're going to give you enormous sums of money, but we don't really think you should get 20% of the profits because we're giving you so much money. So why don't we do this? Why don't we give you a large, very large sum, more than anybody has ever given you, but we'll only give you 10% of the profits. 
So you could say, okay, I could take this large sum of money and get only 10% of the profits, not 20%. Maybe I'll work as hard, maybe I'll make a lot of money, but am I disrupting my, myself by doing that? Because if I do that, will people who are paying me 20% say, well, I'm not gonna do that anymore? So I'm gonna ask people here, if you were in my position and somebody came along and said, I'll give you many billions of dollars and uh, I want you to invest in it, but I'm only gonna pay you because it's such a large sum, 10% of the profits, would you be willing to take the risk that you won't disrupt your existing business and take the money because you're afraid somebody else will get it or because you're afraid that you know, if you don't take it, these investors will never do anything with you again? How many people would take the 10% money? How many people would be afraid you would disrupt your business? Okay. How many sliding scale? What? How many sliding scale? Sliding scale. Sliding scale. Um, you could do that as well. That's a possibility, and maybe, maybe we'll do that. Well, let me ask you another question. Right now, people say to me, I have uh, paying you money even if you're not investing it. It's committed. And you can call it down over five years, but you may not call it down. And so I'm paying you a fee for just holding my money, but, but I'm holding the money. You haven't even taken it yet. So suppose somebody comes along, as people are now doing, and say, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you a nice fee, but only on the capital that you invest. No more fee on committed capital. So how many people here would say, okay, I'd be afraid that if I do that, all my investors will say the same thing, and they won't pay a fee on committed capital, I will have disrupted my own business, or be afraid that if you don't take the money, your peers will take it, and they will get the closer relationships with their investors. How many people would take the money no matter what the terms are, just to have the money, even if they're not getting a fee on committed capital. Anybody would do that? How many people are you afraid you'd disrupt your business? Okay, I don't know what the right answer is. I'll tell you someday. Um, okay, so this is going on in every business. Every business, every day, you find, you might be disrupted, you might find somebody coming along and you have to face this, the dilemma that one day you're a disruptor, but inevitably, if you're very successful a disruptor, you're, you're likely to be disrupted by somebody else. And most businesses at the top do get disrupted. It's very difficult to be nimble at the top and, and, and avoid being disrupted. All right, let me switch to the third subject, great American leaders, and let me deal with the founding fathers bit. So the founding fathers were disruptive leaders. Let me mention one of, or a couple of them. George Washington, everybody's heard of him. Now, everybody's heard of him because he was the first president of the United States, and he was the leader of the Revolutionary War uh, military effort. He won the war, and he was first president. Uh, by, I should say by the, by the, by the side, um, he was a great leader um, for a number of reasons, but when he died, he wasn't all that popular, frankly, for some political reasons. It took a long time before there was a monument built to him, but interesting, when he died in 1799, um, he said, don't bury me for two days. Now, why would he say that? Was that an example of great leadership? Well, in those days, the doctors were so bad, they tended to bury people alive. <laughs> So coffins had bells in them, and you would ring the bell if you woke up alive. That's where the phrase dead ringer came from. He also, in his will, was the only founding father who said, I want to free my slaves. The only founding father. One-third of the uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence were, were slave owners, and about one-third of the people who signed the Constitutional Convention, Constitution at the Constitutional Convention were slave owners. But only one of them freed his slaves upon his death. It was George Washington. But he said, my slaves are freed upon the death of my wife, Martha. So if you're Martha Washington, you're sitting there, you're saying, now wait a second. <laughs> so actually she freed the slaves, but okay. So what was so great about George Washington? Was it great that he was the great military leader? He was a terrible military leader on generally. He lost almost every battle. He did win the war, but wasn't a great military leader. As president, he was pretty good, but he was a little dissatisfied and he wasn't considered uh, maybe as disruptive a president as maybe he thought he was going to be. But his greatness was, was, what, was, was something I would call humility. And he did the two things that really uh, set him apart and really set the tone for our country and really changed the way leaders are looked at. When he, he won the Re Revolutionary War, he did something that nobody had done before, really. Uh, Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Oliver Cromwell, Napoleon, they didn't win a war and say, okay, I'm going back to my, my day job they stayed in power and they ruled. George Washington said, I'm going back to my farm. I'm going back to my plantation. I'm done. I did what I'm going to do. And George, King George said, if that's true, he's given up power that way, he's the greatest man on the face of the earth. 
And that's what George Washington did. And when he was president of the United States, he didn't really want to serve a second term. He did serve it at the behest of many of his friends and so forth. But at the end, he decided he didn't want to have a royalty. He didn't want to stay forever. He didn't want to turn it over to one of his friends or, or somebody that was related to him. He said, I'm leaving. You pick my successor. And that was kind of a tradition that, 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 that stayed with the country for quite some time. The president serves two terms, even though it later became part of the Constitution. It was a tradition he set. And we really kind of got out of the business of, of having a royalty uh, kind of situation because of George Washington. So he led by humility. And that was really one of the great things that was disruptive about the way he led. Most military leaders stayed in power. He did not. Uh, another another uh, disruptive leader was James Madison. He really, uh, I say, was disrupted by persistence persistence. He was a person who recognized the Articles of Confederation weren't were working very well, so he plotted to kind of build the Constitutional Convention. He got it done. He was there every day. He took notes. He, he, he worked very hard to get all the compromises. He got George Washington to show up in, in, at the Constitutional Convention, which wasn't easy. And then when the Constitutional Constitution Convention uh, reached its agreement on the Constitution, he led the effort through the uh, Federalist Papers to get, get it confirmed. And then when he recognized there was no Bill of Rights, and that was one of the problems with the ratification, um, he drafted the Bill of Rights when he was a member of Congress. So he persistence, 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 that's what he did. And really, we have the Constitution we have today, probably more so because of, of, of uh, James Madison's leadership and persistence behind the scenes. He didn't want headlines. He didn't really want to be an out in front. He did it behind the scenes. It was a really interesting way of being a disruptive leader. And a third disruptive leader was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was... Um, person who had an incredible number of jobs. He was our ambassador in France. He was the, the uh, uh, creator of the University of Virginia, governor of Virginia, uh, first, um, uh, first secretary of state. Um, he was uh, third vice president of the United States, third president of the United States, second vice president, first secretary of state. Had a lot of terrific jobs. On his um, tombstone, though, he said he just wanted one thing, or three things, but the first thing was that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence. And he was a, a disruptive leader by his writing skills. He had writing skills that were really quite well recognized at the time. When he was, the, when he was at the Second Continental Congress, he was asked to draft up something called a Declaration of Independence to kind of explain why we were going to break away from England. He did so. He had 17 days to do it. He took the, more or less the last four, as everybody waits to the last minute to do something. And then um, he wrote a document that uh, is probably one of the most famous documents in history, the Declaration of Independence, because it was a very unique concept. We're going to explain to the public and to the world why we're breaking away. There was no legal reason to do that. There was no legal obligation to do that. But he said, I'm going to do that. And he, and, and he did it in a way that was very articulate. And he read three parts of this Declaration of Independence. The first part was the preamble, ignored by virtually everybody. Um, the second part was said, here's all the sins of King George. And the third part was, here's what we're going to do about it. Interestingly, um, the, the Continental Congress changed a lot of it, in his view, mutilated it. But they spent no time on the preamble, essentially. And the preamble contained a sentence in it that became the most famous sentence in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, buried in that sentence is a concept that it was difficult to see how Jefferson did, wrote it. He was a slave owner. He had 60 slaves. He had two slaves with him. But he said, all men are created equal. Now, how could he say that? Because all men weren't created equal, and certainly all people weren't created equal. Um, really, what he, what he was really saying, in effect, at the time is all white Christian men, reasonably well educated, are created equal, more or less. But interestingly, people took this concept and ultimately ran with it. And they basically took his words and they used his words later on to mean that this is what America is all about. All men are created equal. Really means all people are created equal. All people have. Um, equal protections, all people have equal rights, all people have equal freedoms. Now, of course, we fought many wars and did many things to get those rights and freedoms and protections, and we're still fighting for them, but it was that concept that Jefferson wrote in his Declaration of Independence that took hold, and when, of course, Lincoln gave the great Gettysburg Address, that was the concept he, he used. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, of course, we fought a civil war over whether all men are created equal, and we've, we've done many things to make it more than just men and more than white Christian property men. But that concept took hold, and that was a disruptive leadership. And actually, when you think about America, what America is really about and what America did to the world and disrupted the world was it created a society where people could believe that they had a chance to rise to the top. 
they had a chance to be treated equal. And that's why so many people, including my forebears, came here and many of your forebears came here because they thought this was a society that really had disrupted the world. And it disrupted the world by enabling people to think that they could rise up and they could achieve what their, their talents let them do. And for that reason, Jefferson really was uh, quite a disruptive leader. Maybe unintentionally, he didn't realize the time that he was writing that, that it was such an important uh, statement. But he did, through his own word, words, uh, disrupt really uh, society because the way those words were interpreted really disrupted the world. So you take those three leaders, Washington through his humility, Madison through his persistence, and Jefferson through his eloquence, and you have three founding fathers who really um, did things that today would be very difficult to do. I have thought, uh, what would happen today if we put people together in a room and asked them to come up with the equivalent of the Declaration of Independence or the equivalent of the Constitution? Would we be able to get 57 people in the case of the, of the Declaration of the, of, the, of the Continental Congress or 55 in the case of the Con Constitutional Convention to come up with something as good as the Declaration of Independence or as good as the Constitution? I, I don't know the answer to that. My fear is that today uh, Twitter and emails and other things would disrupt the thinking and the dialogue. You never know. Maybe we'd come up with better ideas. But when you think about disruption, think about the people who were disrupting society back in several hundred years ago. What Washington and, and, and uh, Jefferson and Madison and, of course, Benjamin Franklin and John Jay and, and, and John Adams did to really change the course of, of the, not only American history but world history was quite disruptive and something I think we all are indebted to them for, even though they didn't have the term disruption then. Thank you very much. What's the right thing to do? That's a question I've asked thousands of students at Harvard University in my class, Justice. Would it be just to torture the suspect to get the information? Do you think that a person with a bad parent owes them less? Is it all right to steal a drug that your, your child needs to survive? My name is Michael Sandell, and over the years, thousands of students have joined me for an ongoing debate about the moral decisions we face in our everyday lives. This is a course about justice, and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car. Nikolai, if you didn't think you'd get caught, would you pay your taxes? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Do I think I should be able to bid for a baby? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a market, I mean. In a situation that desperate, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you have to do what you have to do. You got, got to do what you got to do. What do you say to Marcus? I've never been in a class like this before, where they kind of asked you to, to, to really think and consider the, the moral right. dilemma. I've never had such a fun class in my life, you know? We turn to the great philosophers of our past for answers. Do you think Bentham is wrong to add up the collective happiness? I don't think he's wrong, but I think murder is murder in any case. Yeah, well, then Bentham has to be wrong. If you're right, he's wrong. OK, then he's wrong. All right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. And we turn to the present to challenge the reasoning behind the moral choices we make every day. I think that what happened in the past has no bearing on what happens today, and I think that discriminating based on race should always be wrong. I just want to say that white people have had their own affirmative action in this country for more than 400 years. It's called nepotism and quid pro quo. So there's nothing wrong with correcting the injustice and discrimination that's been done to black people for 400 years. Even effort depends a lot on fortunate family circumstances for which we can claim no credit. Raise your hand, those of you here who are first in birth order. <laughs> I am too, by the way. <laughs> Mike, I noticed you raised your hand. Taking justice was really an eye-opening experience for me. Everything that you've thought of up to that point becomes questioned, becomes challenged. The purpose of sex is one, for its procreative um, uses, and two, for 
a unifying purpose between a man and a woman. Your beliefs are your beliefs, and that's fine. But civil union is not marriage within the Catholic Church. What is the right thing to do? People have been arguing for, for millennia, really, uh, and there's still not one definite answer. Um, and in ways that's, that makes philosophy impossible, but it makes it beautiful at the same time that we're still debating similar questions. And the reason they're unavoidable, the reason they're inescapable, is that we live some answer to these questions every day. And now, I have the chance to invite you to join us as Harvard opens its classroom to the world. He is one awesome guy, and you are in for a treat. I wrote a speech that is unnecessary at this point. At one point, I thought I lost it, but Walter was sitting on it. And don't believe those horrible things my husband said about me, OK? Anyway, hello, everybody. I uh, didn't like Michael Sandel when I first met him. Can you believe it? It was back in 1999. It was at the Aspen Institute. It was in the big tent, the big music tent. It was our 50th anniversary. and. Um, Michael and uh, Tom Frieden, Friedman uh, were talking about globalization. And um, the Lexus and the Olive Tree, Tom's new book had just come out at that point in 1999, and he thought globalization was going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to mankind, and it was going to level the playing field for everyone, and there was going to be great equality for everybody. And Michael Sandel, quite unpopularly at the moment, said, but wait, it could have dire consequences. It could, it's a matter of how the capital that's created is distributed. Twitter wasn't invented at that point. We didn't know that with 140 characters we could cause a revolution, but he saw the future. Michael Sandel has been a great friend of ours he has been one of my mentors. He's helped my moral compass develop in philanthropy and business and life. And um, for those of you that have never met him before, you're in for a huge treat. And if you know his work, go on YouTube. 30 million people in China and, and all over Asia have downloaded those videos. Every single one of those Justice in Society uh, shows that uh, appeared first on PBS, are available to you. And now I'd like you to meet Michael Sandel. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I can't possibly live up to half of that. When we, before there, the term MOOC had been invented, we did this experiment of opening access to a Harvard classroom really to see it had one purpose as far as I was concerned, and that was to see whether we could use new technology to make higher education a public good, not merely a private privilege. We never imagined that people around the world would be interested in watching lectures about philosophy. And I've tried to figure out why this happened. And traveling around the world in, in recent years, here's why I think it happened. What I find is there is a tremendous hunger in every society to engage in public discussion, reasoned public debate about big questions that matter and especially questions about ethics and values, about justice and the common good, about what it means to be a citizen. I think one of the reasons there is such a hunger is that people aren't getting this in other parts of their lives. One of the reasons I think there is such frustration with politics and politicians and political parties and political institutions 
throughout the world is that people sense, and I think they rightly sense, that there is an emptiness, a hollowness in the public discourse of our societies. If you ask what passes for political discourse in this country, most of the time, it's either narrow managerial technocratic talk, which inspires no one, or when passion enters, it consists of shouting matches, shouting past one another, ideological food fights on the floors of Congress. People are frustrated with this. People want public life to be about bigger things. And they want public discourse to address big questions that matter. I think that's why they've been interested. That's why I think the students who show up in these classes are interested. We try to develop the habit of reasoning together about hard questions on which we disagree, but with mutual respect. And it isn't easy, but when it works, it's exhilarating. I would like to put to you today to invite you to join in a small example of an ethical question that I think is one of the great missing debates in contemporary public life. It has to do with the question of what should be the role of money and markets in our societies. Today there are fewer and fewer things that money can't buy. Give you a small example. When I was a kid growing up, if we went to an amusement park, part of the experience was standing in long lines for the popular rides. That's just part of, it was a kind of democratic experience, though we didn't like it very much. Today, that's no longer the case. In many amusement parks, if you don't like to stand in the long lines and if you have the money, you can buy a special ticket, a fast track or VIP ticket, and go straight to the head of the line. Paid queue jumping in a way. It's not the gravest moral crisis facing the republic, except that this tendency, this habit, is gradually reaching into more and more consequential places. If you go to Washington, D.C. and want to sit in on a congressional hearing, for example, the seats are free and open to the public on a first-come, first-served basis. But sometimes, if it's a popular hearing, there may be quite a long line. And if you don't want to stand in that line, you can go to a company that will hire someone to stand in the line for you for as long as it takes, sometimes overnight, if it's a popular hearing. And when the hearing begins, you, or more likely a lobbyist, will take his or her place at the head of the line. The company that provides this service is called linestanding.com. <laughs> they also will provide the same service if you want to sit in on an oral argument before the US Supreme Court, hiring a paid line stander. Now, these may seem like small examples, paying to jump to the head of the line. But market thinking and market reasoning increasingly reach beyond the domain of material goods into every aspect of life. The way we fight our wars, for example. In Iraq and Afghanistan, there were more private military contractors on the ground than there were US military troops. Now, this isn't because we had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies, but this is what has happened. Over the past three decades, we've witnessed a quiet revolution. We've drifted, almost without realizing it, from having a market economy to becoming a market society. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool. It's a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. But a market society is a place where almost everything is up for sale. It's a way of life in which market values and market thinking begin to reach into every sphere of life, including family life and personal relations, health, education, civic life, law, politics. 
And so here's a question that I think we should be debating, but haven't really debated very effectively. Where do markets serve the, good, the, the public good, and where do they not belong? Now, econ economics textbooks this day, uh, these days will often tell you or tell the, the students who take the courses that economics at its heart is the science of incentives. This seems so natural and obvious that it almost passes without mention. But the language of incentives, which looms so large not only in academic economics, but also in business, in government, in journalism, in common parlance, it's easy to forget that this is a very new way of thinking about what an economy is all about. Adam Smith never used the word incentive. In fact, the word incentive doesn't even enter into economics until the 1940s and 50s. And since then, it only becomes current in the 1980s. Since then, we've invented a verb, a rather, I think, ungainly verb based upon it, incentivize. You've heard that? Incentivize, everybody uses that term now to do with motive, getting people to do stuff. That's really what people use the word incentivize. The word incentivize only, is only invented, only comes into common use around the 1990s and 2000s. But now it's part of the way we not only describe the world, but also think about human relations and motivations. I'd like to put to you a question about incentives, the use of incentives, a financial incentive, to achieve an important social purpose. And it has to do with education. Now, many school districts struggle with a problem. Some of us were discussing uh, last night with John Vesey, who was the superintendent of the Los Angeles public school system. Lots of kids come from families that didn't inculcate strong academic work habits, the love of learning. So how to motivate kids to perform well academically? Recently, with the help of some economists, many large urban school districts have tried the use of incentives, cash payments to get kids to study hard, to do well, uh, to get good grades, do well on standardized tests. They've tried this uh, in pilot experiments in New York City, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C. $50 for an A, $35 for a B. In Dallas, Texas, they have a program that pays young kids, uh, eight-year-olds, $2 for each book they read. Now, the goal is clear, and it's a worthy one, to get kids to study hard to read books. And yet some people object to this practice. I'd like to take, a, just by a show of hands here, a quick survey. Imagine that you are the superintendent of, a, of one of these school districts, and this proposal comes to you. And let's assume that the fo a foundation will provide the cash for the incentive, so it doesn't even need to come out of your budget. How many people think it's worth a try, and how many people would object in principle? First, let's see how many think it's worth a try. Raise your hand. And how many people don't? How many people would object? We have a pretty good division here, almost an even division. Let's hear first, and I think we have handheld microphones. Uh, let's hear first from those who object, those who don't think it's worth trying. What would be your reason? Why would you hesitate to pay cash incentives? Yes. Stand up and tell us your name. The woman sitting toward the back. Stand up and tell us your name and why you would object. My name is Sabina Prusen, and I'm a former teacher. And I feel if you pay kids, children, they work for the prize, and they don't change internally and want to really learn for the sake of learning. They won't learn for the sake of learning. They'll be doing it for the money. And why is that bad? 
Because if they then don't get any money, at some point they'll say, the hell with it. <laughs> All right. And Sabina, what, what age group did you teach? Fourth, fifth, sixth. Fourth. So you would not offer money for them to study hard or read books. All right. Let's hear. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Go ahead. I took your class. I'm a lecturer at Harvard in the economics department. <laughs> in that case, you're not qualified to answer this question. In any event, we and tell, tell, tell us your name. Herbert Rosenfeld. Yes. In any event, we live in a world which does require incentives, passion, desire, and it's become the common norm. Therefore, many students will react, young people will react if they're patted on the back, I believe, or if they're just like Pavlov's dog. They will like react. Pavlov's dog. Exactly. And that's, and that's a reason to do this. You want to turn the students into Pavlov's dogs. No, I said it's similar to Pavlov's. Similar. <laughs> okay. But to answer your question, right. this is a reward in order to incentivize yes, that, there it word, is. There it that is. word, yes. which recognizes that through accomplishment, right. they will garner some degree hopeful of success. So it actually teaches a good habit. I believe that so. That will serve them well in life. Yes. OK, thank you for that. Um, who else? Yeah, go ahead. We've got one over here. Jason Primo. Uh, no, I think it's a poorly thought out concept. Uh, Reading or is it learning? Is that the objective? Uh, who's going to measure that they? Who's going to prove that? Who's going to prove that they've read anything? Who's going to prove that they learned anything? Well, you can give them a quiz. So you're teaching to the test. So you wouldn't pay the money. No. Even if you wouldn't want to see if it actually led to higher grades or more books read. I think the best motivations are within. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, was it me? The woman sitting. Yeah. I'm Anne Marie Higgins, and I completely disagree with Jason. Um, I've always been highly motivated by money, and so my parents <laughs> offered these incentives to me. When you were a kid. When I was a kid. To get good grades to get good grades, to, uh, I got paid a nickel for every lap I would swim during happy hour uh, to keep my parents, you during know. happy hour. <laughs> this, is, this is getting more interesting as we go along. So when right. we would go on vacation, my parents would pay us a nickel each for every oh, lap we would see. swim so they could enjoy their happy hour. Oh, I see, to keep you busy while right. but it works. I understand. It didn't work on my brother, but it worked for me. So, well, it worked to get you to, you're, you're probably a good swimmer by uh, now. But what about for academic achievements, for I reading? Got straight A's. And how much did you get? You got a nickel to swim a lap. How much did you get for an A? 20 bucks. 20? It wasn't a whole lot of money, but I was starting, motivated by money. Starting in what grade did oh, you get gosh. 20? First grade? No. Yeah. $20 for an A in first grade? It was probably a little less then, and then it went up. It went up. And, and it served you well. It did. And my, my parents offered to buy me a new car if I could get all A's through high school. But they offered to buy my brother a Porsche if he could get B's and C's, and he still didn't do it. <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the Porsche. Maybe the Porsche was corrupting. <laughs> What's your name again? I'm Anne Marie Higgins. Anne Marie. All right, we need someone. <laughs> Motivations are within, Jason replied. So who, who has a reply to Anne Marie? That's pretty powerful testimony. Who has a reply? Who disagrees and has a reply? Yes. No, I would not pay my children or would not support children being paid money to get grades because we're living in a world or in a culture 
where we are losing touch with the importance of values. And after a while, you have to stop to wonder if the incentives are no longer present in a way that you can identify with them, right. what you're going to have to revert back to is what's inside and what values you have. My parents took a different approach. When I came home with my report card with straight A's, and I said, so what do I get in return for this? Right. The answer was, you get something in return for it every day. You have a bed to sleep in, you have a home to come to, and you have parents. <laughs> That's what you get. So why are we going to reward you for what we expect you to do anyway? Right. And that's my answer to that. Um, do some people need that motivation? Maybe to get started at something we could argue that they do. But if it's not sustainable over the long term, you're still going to have to go back at the end of the day yeah. to what values have been instilled in students or in people to get optimal results long term. And you think, what's your name? Alicia. Alicia, you think, you're, you worry at least, that offering the cash to the kids. And will, I am a former teacher, by the way. Aha, uh -huh, OK. Yes. You think it would instill the wrong values? I think that it's a slippery slope, and it could do that. Um, I really do. All right. Well, so we have, thank you for that. Thank you for everyone who's joined in this discussion. What, what this discussion brings out are two views about incentives here applied to education, to teaching and learning. There are some, like Alicia and Sabrina, former teachers, who seem to feel that the financial incentive will corrupt or diminish or erode or crowd out other values intrinsic values, the love of reading for its own sake. And there are others who disagree, who say, well, no, maybe this is at least a way to get kids to read in the first place, then maybe, maybe the love of learning will catch on later. And maybe by paying them money, they will learn a good lesson about how our society works, that you get financial rewards if you work hard and you don't if you don't. So, what, this is partly an empirical question. I should tell you what happened with these experiments. The cash for grades or test scores had very mixed results and did not produce appreciable improvements in outcomes. The kids who were paid $2 for each book did read more books. They also read shorter books. But the real question is, what will become of these kids as they develop and as they grow up and go out into the world? Will they have learned the lesson that hard work brings rewards, the good habits? Or will they learn the lesson by this incentive that reading is a chore? a kind of piecework to be done for pay. And if that's the lesson they learn, that's the worry of Alicia and Sabrina, if that's the lesson they learn, then the cash incentive will have driven out or made more difficult to acquire the intrinsic love of reading for its own sake and to learn. Now, we can glimpse, even in this brief debate, something of importance about economic reasoning in general. And it arises in many places. Economists often assume, wrongly, that markets and market exchanges never change the value or the meaning of the goods being traded. The idea is that markets are inert. They're neutral and the value of the goods is independent of the way in which they're acquired. This assumption may be true enough when we're talking about material goods, cars, toasters, flat screen televisions. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, the value of the good will be the same. It will work just as well either way. But the same may not be true 
if we're talking about non-material goods, personal relations, family life, health, education, civic life, in those arenas, introducing market values may undermine or corrupt or crowd out non-market values worth caring about. Some economists did an experiment. In Israel every year they have what they call a donation day where high school students spend a day going door to door raising funds for charitable causes. One year they did an experiment. They divided the students into three groups. The first group was given a short motivational speech about the importance of the causes for which they were raising money and sent on their way. The second group was given the same speech and offered a 1% commission on everything they raised. The third group, same speech, they were offered a 10% commission. Which group do you think raised the most money? Every, some people say the third group, the 10%, others say the first group. No one chose the second. Actually, the first group on no commission raised the most money. Now, the standard economic assumption did work to this extent. Those paid the 10% commission did raise more than those offered 1%. The price effect matters. But those who were paid nothing actually raised more even than those on the 10% commission. This experiment bears out the intuition that came out in the discussion about paying kids to read the books. Sometimes introducing a cash incentive or a monetary value can change the meaning of the activity. In the case of the donation day, what had been a civic project, part of their moral education, was changed, it seems, by the financial incentive into something else, into a kind of deal, into a job, a job on a commission. The meaning of the activity changed. So one assumption that we need to rethink, and it runs very deep in economics, is the idea that markets and monetary values never change the meaning of goods. If we're going to have a public debate about where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, we have to ask not only about the effects, the efficiency effects, we have also to ask about the normative consequences the way in which extending market reasoning and market thinking into non-material domains may change the, the meaning of moral and civic life. There's a second assumption that runs very deep in economics, though it's not an official textbook principle. It's the idea that we should try to use market mechanisms as much as we can in order to conserve virtue and altruism, not to rely on it too heavily. Some years ago, a sociologist wrote a book studying blood donation in the US and in the UK. In the UK, blood could not be bought and sold, only donated. In the US, you could donate blood or you could buy and sell it. Richard Titmus was this famous sociologist, and he concluded that on efficiency grounds, the British system worked better in terms of the uh, consistency of the supply, avoiding tainted blood, and so on. But he had a moral argument. He said creating a market in blood for donation corrupts the altruism embodied in the gift of giving, of donating blood. This study generated a lot of debate. And one of his critics was a, one of the most famous economists of his day, Kenneth Arrow who wrote a review and, among, among other things, challenged the idea that we should rely on altruism rather than on self-interest where we can. And Arrow's reasoning was that if we rely too much on altruism for the supply of blood, we will use it up 
we will use it up and there will be less public spirit and civic virtue and generosity and benevolence available for the times when we really need it. So if the market can deliver enough blood, better to do that and to spare the supply. I do not want to rely, he said, Aero wrote, like many economists, I do not want to rely too heavily on substituting ethics for self-interest. I think it's best on the whole that the requirement of ethical behavior be confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down. We do not wish to use up recklessly, recklessly, the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. So the idea is that uh, if it's true that the supply of altruism and benevolence are fixed uh, as if by nature, like the supply of fossil fuels, then the more we rely on them, the more we deploy them, the less of them we have. And this goes back to an economist in the 1950s who articulated this idea. He asked the question, what does the economist economize in his answer? Love. By relying on and promoting the use of markets and self-interest, we avoid, we economists, spare the society of tapping down, of draining the scarce resource of love, as he put it, the most pre precious resource in the world. Now, to those not steeped in economics, this way of thinking about love may seem far-fetched. I mean, imagine a loving couple. Would they really do better over the course of a lifetime to ask little of one another in hopes of preserving hoarding their love <laughs> so that it would be available when they really needed it. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's the opposite of Stewart's philosophy of give and give. <laughs> See? Now, and yet this assumption runs very deep in economics. Some years ago, not too long ago, a very well-known economist was asked to give what they call the morning prayer in the Memorial Church at Harvard. And he chose as his subject what economics has to contribute to morality. And he drew on this idea. He concluded by, criticize, by, by replying to critics of markets, by replying to those who criticize markets for relying on selfishness and greed. Here's what the economist said. We have only so much altruism in us. Economists like me think of altruism as a valuable and rare good that needs conserving, far better to conserve it, by designing a system in which people's wants will be satisfied by individuals being selfish and saving that altruism for our family, our friends, and the social problems in this world that markets cannot solve. This economistic view of, view of virtue fuels the faith in markets and propels their reach into places where they don't belong. But the metaphor is misleading. Altruism, benevolence, generosity, civic virtue, these are not like commodities that are depleted with use. They are more, it seems to me, like muscles that are developed and strengthened with exercise. That is what Linda and Stuart Resnick have discovered in the Central Valley. And that's what you of the Aspen Action Forum have demonstrated around the world. Working to make the world a better place, deploying rather than conserving generous impulses is not draining. It's energizing. It seems to me that one of the defects, one of the weaknesses of the of public life today is that we let these generous virtues languish. To renew our public life, we need to exercise them more strenuously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.